Um, I am very excited to introduce our friends from Alaska who work in education. Um, Jennifer Arsenault from the Museum of the North in Fairbanks, um, as well as Kaylee uh, Merlot. Um, hopefully I got your name close, to, uh, close there. And um, we are very excited to learn more about what you guys do with students. I know many of the folks here are literally in schools, have worked with many students, done a lot of presentations, have kids, have lots of people we're interested in learning um, about your resources and, um, and talking about that, learning from your expertise. So um, I know I've really appreciated um, some of the resources and they've been very helpful uh, to start using in schools and um, in some of the rural areas in uh, Washington. Um, so uh, please take it away and thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Liz. I, I think I can speak for Jen to say we're both so happy to be here. Uh, at least I know for sure. I'm very happy to be here and to meet all of you. Uh, so you gave me a great introduction. I'm Kaylee, the Education Specialist at the Geophysical Institute in Fairbanks, Alaska. Uh, so at the GI Education Outreach Office, we work with the local teachers, rural villages, uh, tribal councils, and informal learning settings such as libraries uh, and museums all across Alaska to develop place-based educational curriculum and also to help increase STEM resources. So it sounds like you're all in, um, we're all in a good place here together. Uh, so our lessons are a blend of indigenous Alaskan knowledge and also Western science. And our grants do allow us to use our cultural connections model, which I'll speak to a little bit later, uh, where we can actually visit rural communities and learn from native Alaskan leaders for what their communities actually need. So then we can uh, base our Aurora curriculum, uh, kind of make it more place-based. Um, so I will go through some of our resources uh, that we have on our website, but before I do that, I'm going to pass the torch to Jen to give her formal introduction. <laughs> sure, I don't know how formal it will be, but thanks for having us, uh, Liz and, and everyone that's here today. Um, it's nice to nice to get to know the Aurora Source Ambassadors and a little bit more about um, what, what you all do. Uh, so yeah, I am also in Fairbanks at the University of Alaska Museum of the North um, and very similar to what Kaylee said, their um, goals are, are our goals. Um, I'm the Director of Education and Public Programs here at the museum. And so we do outreach with all kinds of communities, um, including formal school groups, as well as um, family learning or folks that come to the museum um, for all kinds of reasons. A lot of them that are very interested in the Aurora and that's why they found themselves in Fairbanks. Um, so there are, uh, you know, our Aurora film here at the museum, people that are visiting for that reason. Um, so we we do outreach in a, in a number of ways and we're hoping to share some of that with you and also get ideas from you all. So I'm gonna let Kaylee go first and have her share some of their resources. Okay, can everybody hear me all right? Thumbs up. Yeah, very good. Okay, um, so I'm going to share my screen in a little bit and I'm going to go through uh, just a little bit of our Learning Through Cultural Connections, the Northern Lights curriculum. Uh, so it weaves together science concepts about the Aurora Borealis with Inupiaq culture and language. Uh, so the project you'll see includes three key elements. We have a classroom introduction kits and then we have interactive museum exhibits as well as a 25 minute uh, video. It's called Q Kiuguic, uh, the Northern Lights. So in Inupiaq, Kiuguic uh, means Northern Lights. And maybe Jen, you can correct me if I'm saying that wrong. Uh, not but me. I pra I I'm not your Inupiaq speaker. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and thanks to YouTube, I think I, I think I have it done pretty well. But the the 25 minute video that I can I can share a YouTube link in the chat uh, here in a little bit. But it can also be displayed on the planetarium. So we've had students come in and uh, get to watch that 25 minute video, and it's it's a really great video to watch. Um, so the goals of our curriculum are to increase STEM content uh, and knowledge about the aurora, support the preservation of Inupiaq. Uh, culture and language, and then also increase knowledge of Inupiaq legends, songs, and dances. Um, so I'll, I, I won't go through all of the curriculum, but I will share my page. And um, 
and show you some of what we have. So if I share my screen, let's see. Google Chrome. So I believe so everybody looking at cultural connections, the Northern Lights, do you see a purple? Yes. Can you give yep. me, yeah, thumbs up. Wonderful. Okay. Uh, so this URL, the cultural connections.gi.alaska.edu, I can share that in the chat. Uh, this is where you'll find a lot of our content for Aurora. Um, I'll let you go through. There's educational digital videos as well as some interviews that are really rich in culture. So I encourage you to do that. But since, since we're all teachers here, I'm going to um, take you to the teachers tab. Uh, and we might as well just start in the first one for elementary uh, teachers manual and worksheets. So this pretty much has everything for elementary age. And then uh, this is just separated. You have your teacher's manual and your uh, elementary worksheets. So if you just wanna print a worksheet, you can go straight there and print it. Um, so I'll go through that. And then just the middle school manual is, uh, it's very similar to the elementary. It just kind of dives deeper into some physical science and some concepts and has less, let me just click on the edge, elementary, uh, has less, less prompting and it's more open for the middle schoolers to kind of um, take control of that education journey. So uh, we have Kiyuguik, the Northern Lights. Uh, the first little part is basically a note to the educator, talks about our science, um, national standards. But then what I really like about this is that it also has Alaska cultural standards. So for a Nupiaq framework, uh, environment is really important. Uh, talking about song and dance, it's the culture and the storytelling is there's, there's a lot of rich storytelling involved in, uh, in this curriculum. And then of course, relationships. Um, so I encourage you to kind of read through some of that, but I'm just going to get down to our first activity. And uh, please jump jump in if I'm going too fast. Uh, so the first activity, storytelling, like we said, uh, for Nubia cultures, storytelling is really important. And so we wanted to in incorporate storytelling. So you'll see these people here, each one has a story about the Aurora and it points to where they live and you can actually watch, we have that media on our website. Um, it's a really great way to get to know culture and even just individuals and stories. Um, so I, I think before we had the, the scientific tools to study the aurora, people were telling stories, right, of um, to, just to try to ex understand the aurora. And so cultures are built upon those stories. And, uh, and it's this is a great way to just listen to their stories and kind of understand, um, understand the culture around the Northern Lights. Uh, so this encourages people to, uh, for I believe for the middle school, you can actually uh, write a letter to an elder and invite them into your classroom and hear their stories. Uh, but this is also, so then the students can listen to the story and then reflect what they liked about the story, um, what they learned, that sort of thing. And then down below, the students can actually write their own story. And for elementary, it has more of the prompts. Um, but for middle school, they you can kind of be free to write your own story however you'd like. Uh, so that, that one I really like because it incorporates culture. And then activity two, uh, maybe I'll go through the first three activities just so you get an idea and then you can um, jump back into that after the meeting because I don't want to take too much of our time. But uh, again, we talked about language, the Nubiak Northern Lights vocabulary. I love this activity. You have flashcards you can download and there's one that I just loved. Um, let's see if I can scroll down. Okay, so this one, I, I love doing this as a, as a child where you um, draw a line to the correct word in Inupiaq. So of course, Northern Lights, you look for uh, Hugh Buick and the child, the student would um, draw a line here and so on and so forth. And I, I believe, so this is, just has all the ingredients. When I'm talking to students, I kind of, um, I equate it to making a batch of cookies like the Northern Lights. There's three three important ingredients. And if you take one of those ingredients out, it's not the Northern Lights. So if you're making cookies with your grandma and you forget the sugar, then they're not cookies. If you're if you're wanting to see the Northern Lights, you need to make sure you have the sun, the sun's particles and the atmosphere and the magnetic uh, fields. So 
um, that's kind of a good way for kids to imagine, oh, I just need those three ingredients. Uh, as a child, I like making cookies with my grandma. So, and it seems to, it seems to really work for those, for the students I work with. Uh, and then, so for the activity three, welcome the sun dance. This one is really great because it gets uh, kids up and moving. Uh, you can watch the you can watch the Inupiaq dance. It's a traditional dance, so you're learning about the culture and learning about Alaska and how it's you know it's dark for so many months, and then when the sun comes back, we're celebrating that with these motions. And uh, and since we wouldn't have aurora without the sun, we wanted to incorporate this cultural piece in our curriculum. Um, yeah, so I think I won't I won't uh, go through all of them, but uh, that's kind of our, the basis of our curriculum. Does anybody have any questions? Or actually, let me just show you before I open the floor to some, oh, actually, before I pass it to Jen. Uh, I wanted to show you, we had talked about this being a really cool sticker. So this is a poster of the three ingredients, right? The, the sun and it has the Nubiac, um words language vocabulary and has the sun's particles and the magnetosphere and our earth. Uh, so we have this and uh, and we offer it to people, but it's if, if you have printing access to a good printer, it's a really great poster to have. Uh, and then here's those vocabulary cards that you could print with the new yeah let's see if it loads. Maybe. Oh, this isn't. Okay, there we go. Yeah, so you can print these um, and it will have all of the, um, all of everything you would need. And I think that's all I really wanted to show you. Does anybody have any questions right now? Or is there anything you're really wanting to see before I pass the torch to Jen? Okay. I'm gonna stop sharing my, how, how do I, dot, how, there we go. I'm gonna stop sharing <laughs> and, and Jen, I'm gonna let you take the floor. Great, all right. I am also gonna share screen. So let's get that up, show from beginning. All right, so just a little grounding um, again. So uh, as we shared, um, we're both here in Fairbanks, so this is a picture of the museum um, on a still bright <laughs> winter day, so maybe it's a early fall or late spring. Um, but we, we have a lot of time to view Aurora here in Fairbanks because we have a lot of dark sky season. Um, so that's kind of makes it, you know, a special, special place to be and why um, even here at the museum, we have spent a long time um, sharing about the Aurora. Uh, the Geophysical Institute is actually just sort of behind the museum in this photo. Um, so we're, we're close by, we're both on the same campus here at UAF, and we do, you know, similar kinds of work in our outreach offices, um, but our science is different. So the, the Geophysical Institute um, has specialists like Don and others who study the Aurora. Here at the museum, we have collections, um, and we don't have space science collections, um, but we have a long time of working with the public who are interested in all things Alaska. Um, so that's why we have been in this kind of realm of Aurora sharing for a long time. And then we um, also work as a partner in NASA's Heliophysics Education Activation Team, um, along with the GI uh, and other partners to share information about the sun. Um, and for us, that often is centered on Aurora. Um, so that is kind of a little bit about why we're doing this. Um, and then just a little bit more grounding. So a lot of what Kaylee shared comes from uh, Inupiat cultures, which are in the northern part of the state. We are right in the middle part of the state. Uh, so UAF is on the homelands of the Tanana people of the lower Tanana River. So we are seated in Dana territory um, and acknowledge that that knowledge and those traditions that um, have have gone on for a long time and brought us a lot of the knowledge that we do have about Northern Lights, as well as people um, from around the state that have different cultural traditions and different stories that they share. Uh, Trafiada is the name of the hill that we sit upon, so that's just an acknowledgement of that place. 
Um, so as I shared, we do public programs of all kinds. Um, so maybe this fits with some of the things that you do or are interested in. Um, those are supposed to be suns. They look like flowers on my screen. Um, so we do family programs, folks that come to the museum um, for the past few years, we reach them through Zoom or other means. Um, we do those offsite as well. So we go to schools or to other um, entities like libraries or other museums throughout the state. Um, we have family nights that are held in school gyms. Um, we have one that's focused on Aurora and Aurora Science Night. Um, after school training and programs with um, similar goals of trying to increase STEM awareness and, and increase um, quantity of, of science that's happening in after school programming um, around the state. And so to that end, we have resources like museum kits that we loan out um, and include materials. Um, and then we do a lot of, have done a lot of things like virtual learning. We were forced into that, but it's become, um, you know, a blessing as well. Um, and learning packets that we mailed out. Um, these were space-focused space, space -focused packets that we did. Um, we called them Aurora packets because they had two to three acti Aurora activities in them, as well as some other solar system activities. Um, so we mailed those around the state. Uh, through connections with after school programs, 4 H, various programs that had can contact with kids and families, um, and especially when they couldn't be reached virtually um, the past few years. But it's also something that um, is always a need is, you know, real physical materials and ways to connect. Um, so we have the uh, activities that I'm going to share with you Aurora art, Aurora bracelet, those kinds of items in there. And then in including um, in addition to the instructions, you know, they'd get a packet with their Aurora bracelet beads and their chalk and their paper, black paper, um, because we don't want any hurdles for, for people to, to participate. And so however we could remove that, we could. Um, so I'm sure you've all faced your own issues with supply chain, but, you know, learning how restricted colored chalk was during the pandemic was something I got to find out and buy out all of the, you know, beads in town. Um, but we were trying to do that on behalf of all of these families around the state so that they could then have resources and not have to do that. Um, and so that those um, out of school learning folks, librarians, leaders, teachers um, could could do Aurora learning and have fun with the kids and not have to be like, well, we can't find black construction paper. Um, and then we also have had space camp, um, which we touch upon Aurora because of where we are. It's real place based for Alaska to, to certainly include that in any discussions of space. Um, the first space camp we held was virtual. Um, and then we followed it up with some sessions that were um, in person this year. Um, so those are some of the things that we do. And a few photos that might, um, you know, just kind of share a, a sense of what some of these events are kind of like. Um, the one on the top on the grass is kiddos running around at space camp and uh, pretending that they're enacting the aurora here. Um, so I'll share this link to this activity with you. Um, but this is a kinesthetic activity. It can be done in a gym. We did it outside. Um, the kids with blue silks are the atmosphere. Um, the ones running excitedly down the hill with the red and yellow are the solar wind. Um, so they're supposed to pause if they don't get tagged by the atmosphere, <laughs> which they don't always do. Um, and then the atmosphere, if they tag them, then those solar wind kids can then go down and tag the other kids who have aurora silks, so greens and reds and some violets. Um, and it's, of course, just a fun way to reinforce the idea of um, why we see the aurora in the sky, um, how, it's, how it's created, um, as well as get the willies out for the day. <laughs> um, and then there's just some pictures here to give a sense of like a science night. So um, at a, a science night, we're trying to get families to engage with each other, um, not as much with us. It's not about us giving a presentation. Um, so we share these activities. Um, but usually we utilize volunteers from the community. So those might be teachers, they might be parents, it could be all kinds of folks that will lead those stations. Um, and then they can coach in doing something like making an Aurora bracelet. You see the red and green beads there that some families are working on together. Um, and so that they're having those conversations and hopefully having a good time 
and having fun while learning about the aurora. And I think there's also a photo I've included there of just um, doing a demonstration with a Tesla coil and spectrum tube, and that was at space camp. So sometimes experiences sort of have to, you know, have to be seen on screen or seen in person. Other times they can be done without us there at all. Other times we're sort of the middle facilitator. Um, so those are just some ideas. We really focus on hands-on learning. Um, so I'm gonna escape here for a moment. And we'll see, I'll just stop share for a second and visit our website um, where you can find any of these resources if you have people that are interested or you yourself are doing teaching um, and want to share. I probably already had it open. <laughs> Sorry, I'm lost on my screen. All right, share screen. There it is. And some of the activities that are linked here um, will look familiar to what Kaylee has already shared because, um, of course, if it's a good resource, we share it. <laughs> um, and we might make it more digestible for the audiences that we know that are, you know, we're working with. Um, so on our space science page, um, under hands-on activities, we've got different themes. And Aurora is the first one. And then there's again a collection of different kinds of resources. Um, so there's again a link for hands-on activities, um, as well as videos, video of Liz talking about Aurora, as well as others. I think there's one of Don there too, um, under the videos. Links and resources goes to some other good things that we found useful. But other hands-on activities, we've got all of these um, listed as PDF files that are accessible. Um, and downloadable and free to use, reproduce, print, um, change, whatever, whatever you want to do with them. Um, and so some of the things that we do uh, a lot are Aurora Talk Art. Um, and I'll click on that one just to give you a sense of that. Um, so this one's pretty straightforward and it's a really comfortable way for people to come in and engage and start to think about the science because it's like who hasn't colored um, it's fun to color with chalk it's fun to color on paper um, and we allow creativity but then we can start discussing things like why do we see the colors we see um, where you know what what elements would you put in for your setting where do you see the aurora would you see it with palm trees um, what kind of setting would you like to put in? Um, so this is a fun, easy start, um, and that requires very little in terms of resources, but you do need that colored chalk. <laughs> um, the template is just a wavy line um, to help you smudge, and then we include some background as well. And let's see. Uh, and I do have, uh, I don't know if you mostly see the screen, but I have an example there. This is just my coworkers chalk art um, with the colors in the right locations in the sky um, in terms of each other. And then there's another one that we have that's watercolor art. Um, that's maybe a little a little more uh, open-ended or, or uh, in artistic interpretation instead of as much directed at the exact forms of the Aurora. Um, but this one can be really fun with older students. We've also done it with adults as a workshop, um, just as a fun way to, again, make colorful sky and start to open up that conversation. So we, we do a lot where it's integrating um, the science, the art, the culture together. Um, those are things we're all kind of interested in. And hopefully, if you're talking about them, you're going to find that spark for somebody that might not exist for somebody else. So again, it comes with some, some background, distinct versus diffuse aurora. So a little bit there that you can share. Oh, Steve, we've got something about Steve there. Um, and so, you know, information to share while you're doing an, an art activity. Uh, I won't show you all of the things on this page. Like you can see there's several there. We have connections to Northern, uh, the Northern Lights curriculum that Kaylee shared about. Um, some of those we've parsed out into smaller pieces because we've used them. Um, so all of these has been, have been used and tested by us in different settings. So um, like the Northern Lights Storybook um, is an activity we've done at family days and other events here at the museum. So we've parsed that out as like, here's just the story sheets if you want to do that. And then if you want deeper, here's the link on the Cultural Connections website. 
Um, and I should mention that for the chalk art, there um, is a how-to video for that that we created because that was shared so widely during the pandemic. We wanted a resource for the teachers that, that were interested or the families that were interested in watching how to do it instead of just reading how to do it. So there's a link to that there. Um, and the watercolor art project was from another um, an artist online who was willing to let us share. And so there's a tutorial video in the PDF a link to that where she's explaining how to do that artwork. So lots of ways to learn how to do these activities. Uh, I think I will show you the kinesthetic activity write up since I mentioned that one. That's Aurora Ingredients. Um, and so just as I mentioned, we just use colored silks as a way to, you know, make it a tactile um, experience and then they run around and move um, and this is really you know valuable for after school learning um, when you've got kids who have spent the whole day in classroom they're still going to spend some time at school but they're ready for some movement ready for something different so we've even done a layout for the gym <laughs> you know here's how you could set it up um, and you had seen the photo of us on the lawn so you can be pretty open-ended about it and then there's suggested rules suggested ways to do this so that they can kind of get the sense of how to how to play the game um, we had a hard time getting our kids to stop during space camp and finally maybe one other one other just sort of random one because it's just because you're all aurora chasers you might have suggestions for us here is <laughs> um, we try to do some that are really science driven and others that are art and then some that are just fun. Um, so this is, you know, thinking about what would you put in your Northern Lights backpack? Um, and so we've got a paper template of a backpack as well as items that you might pack. Um, so this might be fun for Aurora chasers. It's like, well, what did we actually, what did we not include here that we should have? I think that you all could help with that. We've got camera, but this is probably not the right kind of camera. Um, <laughs> But it would be fun to to hear some feedback on that. But this is something we've done um, at family days and other events too. We've had them make their paper backpack, and then when we were um, talking to kids virtually, we were suggesting that they go around their house and find items. And you know, there was discussion about why you would or wouldn't include something. So that's kind of the broad overview of a lot of the things that we have developed or have used. Um, and, and I think that the final thing we wanted to do um, before opening up for questions was a little sharing and viewing the Aurora. Kaylee, do you want to set us up for that? Absolutely. Thank you, Jen. Uh, yeah, so uh, we thought it would be kind of fun just to sh illustrate something that we do with our students. So you're going to be our students for today. Um, and we're going to invite you to maybe take a minute or two to either write a story, could be fictional, non-fictional, uh, about the Aurora, or, uh, or just draw a picture. So whichever side of your brain you want to work with. Um, so I will just give a little introduction. And then I believe Jen has a little video that you could just have in the background and watch occasionally as you draw your picture or kind of write a story. Uh, so as I said before, in Inupiaq cultures of northern Alaska, the aurora are known as Kyuguik. So according to Inupiaq lore, the Kyuguik are the spirits of ancestors playing a game of kickball in the sky. The lights swirl with the movement of the game. Uh, traditional stories warn children that the Kyuguik can swoop down to earth and remove people's heads. We don't typically tell our students that are young um, that portion, but uh, but it is a fun fun cultural element that I wanted to share. Share. So these stories help us visualize the Northern Lights and understand its importance to Northern cultures. Uh, so we're wanting to invite you to maybe if you have a piece of paper and a pen, uh, yeah, paper and pen to, um, to write a little story with the beginning, middle and an end or draw a picture of the Northern Lights and Jen, you can uh, share a YouTube video. Sure, I will do that. So yeah, if it inspires you to write or draw, that's great. If you just are chilling for a few minutes, that's fine. Um, it's about three minutes, and then we'll and then we'll come back for questions. Let's see if I can share. Uh, and this is actually from Fairbanks photographers as well, um, Ron and Marquetta Murray, um, who are the Aurora Chasers, and they made this video. Let's do full screen. Everyone see? Mm 
Thank you, Jen. Yeah. If you drew a picture, you are welcome to just hold up your your picture of the aurora, and we can we can see that. Or maybe if there's a minute, if anyone has a burning desire to share their story, it might be kind of fun to hear someone's story. Does anyone want to? Oh, nice. Thank you for sharing, Laura. This was a fun, fun activity to do just virtually, you know, with the pandemic, because it did uh, give children time to uh, work independently, but then come together. And then everybody had stories to share why, you know, the, the cabin they drew was a cabin they went to with their family when they saw the Aurora. Um, it's a really great way to kind of bring everybody together and still feel that community element during a time of pandemic. When you might be feeling like you're lacking that. Hey, Kelly, 
Um, this is CK here. Uh, not really a story, but uh, kind of a general observation when I go Aurora chasing. And we have also discussed that here on uh, on the Aurora Saurus as well. So one of the observations I've seen is the the coyotes and the wolves start to howl a lot um, <laughs> when the, uh, the auroras are just incoming or inbound. And as an Aurora chaser, we kind of always use that as an indication, like when we are almost ready to pack up and you hear the coyotes or the uh, the wolves howling, we kind of just stay back. I was wondering if you had had, uh, from your experience, heard any of the uh, stories from uh, the uh, First Nations or Inuits, or uh, how do they have any that sort of observations or uh, any stories around that? This is the first I've heard of something like that. That is really cool. Thank you for sharing. Okay. Jen, can you speak to that? Have you heard any? That's a new one to me too. It's uh, it's intriguing, yeah. But I I love that when you do talk about Aurora, um, you know, a, a, anything you get people's personal connections. But Aurora seems to really bring out these, um, you know, all kinds of connections. Whether it's observations about what happens, you know, right before or right during um, the sounds of the Aurora. I've heard so many things about the sounds of the Aurora from people. Um, so it's it's a really fun, rich topic to engage with folks in. Okay. Now I'm going to listen for, for people sharing about coyotes <laughs> or wolves because you, you can't be the only one. <laughs> okay. All right. Thanks. I was so happy, Jen, that you that you were able to show some um, physical objects. We, we actually have our Aurora kit checked out by a teacher here in town, so I wasn't able to show anything. Um, but we do have a really cool magnetic field viewer. So I don't know, oh, Jen, you have it, great. So I like this because you can, the students can see the magnetic field because there's the iron, iron files fall to the bottom and then you flip it over eventually. And then the iron uh, collects in the, it's trapped, gets trapped. There you go, you can kind of see the magnetic field. So I like that visual for students. And then another visual that we have that I, that I like to show is, um, I don't have our, the two viewer, but I do have, oh, thank you. There's some more iron filings. So uh, maybe you can't see this with my screen, but this is uh, neon light. So I like to talk about biomimicry and how, um, you know, put put gas in a tube and that's basically the, the neon lights or the neon lights, how, that's how the aurora works with, um, with the different gases of our atmosphere. So, and we have this tube that has different gases. And so when you, when you switch it, it based on the, based on the gas that a different color is, is enlightened. So anyway, those are some of our physical things that I wish I could have shared with you. But. Yeah, are there any other questions? And I have been great about monitoring chat. So if there's a question there, you might need to repeat it. I'd like to jump in here. Um, the Spanish name I have is Juan Carlos and uh, my nickname is Carlos. So. Uh, Carlos is fine, and uh, so a uh, little little bit about what uh, Liz and I are doing together. We're co-creating education modules in traditional communities. So we're working with elders and um, assuring that we don't appropriate and uh, we're not the individuals that take the tellings and record them if that's not permitted. So I want to share what I'm up to with uh, Liz and uh, it's a really exciting opportunity uh, and it's also to see your work. It's a uh, really amazing work, beautiful work. Um, and I just applaud you for such a beautiful effort. Um, and so a couple of thoughts. So we have some tellings about the Aurora Borealis in the Southwest, that's where I'm from. And um, when we talk about coyote, coyote places the stars in the night sky. And so because coyote places the, um, the stars, they speak when the sun speaks, because that's our grandfather. And it speaks with these particles, which creates these lights. And so that's why the coyote looks up to these lights to communicate with our one star, our grandfather. Um, so it's a communication, and that's why there's sound that comes from it and, and such. But I um, just want to share that for the group. Uh, but my question is on connecting the classroom mathematics to these particular activities that you all are undertaking. Um, and the reason why I ask is because 
um, so often some of the traditional knowledge it can be relegated to art, and art is math. But are you um, have you been able to um, you know create formulas or arithmetic uh, principles connected to that particular art so that the teachers can apply that in their classrooms? I can speak a little uh, to that, not, not as much with the Aurora, but um, I mean, the first thing I thought of when I'm talking about the Aurora is how far up is it? Everybody wants to know, can it touch the, can it touch the earth? How, where is it in the sky? And I think Don Hampton is uh, the first one that I heard say this. If, uh, if you're in Fairbanks and you drive just 60 miles, Don, you might have to correct me. <gasps> oh, good. Okay, I'm not muted. If you drive just 60 miles to, uh, I guess that would, would that be Nanana? Uh, and then you just put that vertical that's that's where the aurora is that's where you'll see the greens uh, yeah. and i just i love that uh for i mean there's some numbers there right the distance um I, that jumped out to me for formula jen is there anything that you've or maybe don if you want to Something yeah, I similar say, and maybe not at the level. Oh, sorry. I'll, well, it's okay. I, I was just going to say, yeah, if, I always say if you just turn your bus and face straight up and drove 60 miles an hour for an hour, that's where you'd start running into the Aurora. That gives a good sense. Everybody thinks it's really close, but it's it's a lot further away than most people think. So. Yeah, it's a big um, question, Juan Carlos. I think, you know, we, we haven't spent as much time um, doing informal excitement um on, on math fields and it, you know me personally or, or my staff um and it's a it's a good it's a good thing to think about like how how do we incorporate that and we definitely do in in some of our programming and, and even for aurora um it probably falls in a similar vein though we've done astrolabe um and so you're making a triangulation tool um and using that to to figure out how can you tell how high something like the aurora is and you can do it by using this tool you know that you would use on a ship that you would use to look at the stars um, that you could measure the height of tall trees with. Um, and so we've done that with Aurora programming regularly. Um, I'm not sure if there's a link on our website or not, but we do have that written up to do the astrolabe and then do the triangulation calculations. Um, so that's one that comes in kind of regularly, but um, even at science night, we do the astrolabe because it's fun to walk away with this tool. We, we use a straw for the viewer and a paper protractor. Um, and so that's kind of a fun one, even at those sort of events. But um, I don't have a ton of them for Aurora that are that that fall solidly in, in math. Um, just a quick follow up. And how about with physics? Do you have examples and you know context for like uh, observation and something that the teacher or community can uh, essentially apply mathematics toward? Kayla, you have a, a more um, con like uh, a content driven and uh, not content driven um, cultural standard and um, uh, academic standard driven content on your website. Um, mm -hmm. Do you, you want to? Yeah, I would. I was just thinking through our the the middle school content because that's where you'll find a lot of the physical science, more of the mathematics. I know that um, not not physics, but we have we have a uh, where the students map out like where where. Uh, planets are in relation to the sun, so there's distance there where they um, they can actually. Am I? I'm not muted. Um, so that if you if you can uh, go to our the middle school, you'll see some mathematics there. Um, the other thing we talk about, I have a little globe here that I send with our kits, um, but the the latitudinal line of the 65th degree here it's not math but we it's a number we're talking about that and and I talk a lot about how we talk about the northern lights but did you know there's southern lights also it's just penguins don't talk <laughs> they can't talk so we hear more about the northern lights than southern lights but um but yeah as far as like math and and more physics uh um we I can't I can't speak to that as much unfortunately and yeah. i think for for us you know we fall in this informal education role pretty solidly and so we're often um in that excitement engagement piece which happens first um and then if you know if we have high school um 
teachers involved, they might be taking it that step further, but I don't, you know, always know what they're, what they're doing to do that. Um, or if, you know, families are super engaged, maybe they're signing up for Aurorasaurus and getting involved in that way, let's hope. Um, but, but we don't, uh, at the museum necessarily do a lot that is, um, designed to be like, here's your classroom lesson, um, you know, that's, that's going to be your full curriculum or anything like that. So, um, so we don't always get that, that kind of depth because we're really trying to start at the excitement piece. Yeah, we, we do have another curriculum. It's our snow curriculum. Uh, and that it, there's a lot of math involved with that. Um, and I can send you the link for that. Uh, but it would it would be really great to get in touch with you. And I'm just going to put my email in, in the chat. And we can talk about successes and kind of uh, where our projects meet. Thank you so much. Um, any other comments or questions? No, we're running up on time here. We have time for a few more. Well, I, I was just going to say that grade four is doing a, an activity for Aurora tomorrow. And they asked me to, um, if I can go there and talk about the Aurora and then kind of explain why and how it like dances and all that stuff. So I think, you know, like I'm going to have lots of homework here by reading what you guys do there. And then, you know, use that and use it for the kids here in Edmonton. So thank you. Awesome. Yeah, so I'm just nice. looking at activity three for the middle school curriculum for uh, Northern Lights. That has um, uh, the modeling of the sun and the earth system. So that's what I'm thinking of where you have your 100 meter measuring tape. Um, and there, there's some math incorporated in that. There is a lot more with our snow curriculum. The Northern Lights, we focus most, mostly on Inupiaq culture and language. So um, if you want if you want more uh, math and kind of physics related, I would, I will send that link to you. Anyway. I have one question yep. about, um, sorry. Um, I, I guess I had one question about whether um, doing the cultural activities um, with people in the culture, if there are still reservations about talking about the Northern Lights or um, how you approach that in a sensitive way, appropriate way. Yeah, I, I know for us, before we ever get a camera out, we first go into the community and we make connections. That's our primary focus. So we, we don't even send a videographer or anybody. We go to the community, we learn about the community, we learn about their needs, we meet with elders, we hear stories, but we don't have them recorded as much. And then once we feel like we have made connections and once we feel, it, if we don't feel welcome, if we, it, you know, we can kind of gauge that. And once we feel welcome, then we can approach um, some of the elders and kind of knowledge bearers and say, and, and ask them. Um, and at that point, you know, they're, we we only receive what what it, it, what are is gifted to us what people are happy to offer as far as stories go and we have round tables where we'll we'll have community events um, and potlatches where we'll come in and we'll bring fish and um, really get to know the community and hear stories and um and our in our curriculum that we're working on now everything we we want it to be, we want there to be an element of how can we, how can we serve your community? Um, so there's the keeping the culture alive and, and the language and the stories in addition to, you know, what, what, what can we do for, what can we do for you? How can we serve you? Because we feel, you know, we feel like we have received such a huge gift just hearing stories and, and being welcome into communities. So that's, that's my take on that. Yeah, and in our experience with any of the rural um, science nights that we've done with with Aurora or Space Focus or both, um, you know, is it somewhat self-selecting? Obviously, who's going to come to the to the program? Um, so you know that 
we don't necessarily know who who doesn't think that it's right but we we like kaylee mentioned we try to do the same ahead of time and we make the local connection so we don't even go without an invitation um we make sure that that we're wanted there um, and that it's something that that they're wanting for their community um so that that helps um and then we have found, um, particularly for Aurora, um, but you know, with any subject, you're more comfortable talking with people that you already know. Um, and so we try and embrace that in our programming, like our science nights and have those local volunteers, have those people leading stations, not us, um, so that the, the dialogue is happening amongst people that know each other or, or at least from the same community. Um, and, and with Aurora, that has been really more, I, I've noticed it to be more helpful than I have with other subjects. Very cool, that's a great tip. Um, I wanna thank you both again.